How many of you have walked into a social situation and worn the wrong thing? Right? You walk into a setting and you are completely underdressed and you look around and you're doomed. Because you're stuck, you can't go anywhere. It's not like you can go home and change. Right? I, I've had this happen to me, and I've had it explained that you get like two to one degree of flexibility, but you can't go two. Like if you're in a room and you're supposed to be wearing slacks and a, and a sport coat, you can wear a suit, and you can get away with a sport coat and jeans, a sport coat, or you can get away with maybe like a button down and a slacks, but you better not be wearing jeans. Like you can't go too far. And like if you're expected to wear a sport coat, if you show up wearing a tux, man, what's wrong with you, right? I, I thought of that as I was thinking about these uh, magi as they show up to see, see Jesus. How overdressed do you think they were, right? They have put on their finest and they have brought gifts to give a newborn king. And if you were going to go and meet the most one of the most important people alive, how nicely would you dress? Or would you just go buy something fancier than you already own, right? And, and so they're going to see, and they're, we do need to name up front, they're, they're not kings per se, they're royalty. They're connected to the royal family, they're educated, uh, they have, uh, but they're also not like in direct succession because if they were in direct succession, they wouldn't have been able to leave the country for two years. That's how long they're gone. It takes a year to go find Jesus, it takes a year to go back. We know that based on when Herod said he killed all children under two years of age. That's, so we have a rough guess of how long this journey took. And so they show up with these gifts, and they have these assumptions. Like, if you're going to go find the king, you're going to go to the capital city, except that's not where they find him. And they roll into town with their gifts, there are three gifts. How many, how, many, how many people were there? How many of these magi were there? Three. We don't know. It never actually says. There are three gifts. It could have been two magi and one was generous. It could have been five magi and two were bums. It could have been six and they brought two, two brought gold, two brought frankincense, two brought myrrh. We, we, we don't know. It just says magi and there were three gifts. And so they roll into town trying to find Jesus. And it's, they don't find him in Bethlehem, they, or they find him in, in, in Jerusalem, they find him in Bethlehem. And so they're dressed to the nines, and they roll into this village of a thousand people. And there's no one to greet them. There's no one to like blow, blow trumpets as they're rolling into town. There's no one. Get, there's like no line to honor. Get, get in line to honor this child. And and I want you just to imagine this moment for for a minute. They like they ride into town. And they've been traveling for a year, and there's no such thing as a Motel 8. And so they have to travel with everything they need. So they're not, and they don't speak the language. So they have to, it's themselves, they've got to have their translators, they've got to have their local guides, they've got to have the people to bring baggage. So let's just say there's three, just for tradition's sake. This has got to be at least 20 people riding into town in this event. So they're all riding into town, and... Um, they're all dressed up, and, and they find the house uh, uh, of Jesus, and they go in, and Mary, had, she knows something is special about Jesus. Do the neighbors? Like, the neighbors don't. To the neighbors, it's like, hey, there's Joseph. He makes a good chair, but, like, what are all those people doing at his house? It's a very weird moment, right? And so they show up. And, and I, I have a feeling that they were probably surprised and kind of at a loss for what to do immediately. Again, think back to if, if you were going to go meet someone important, if you're going to go meet, let's say you're going to go meet your senator in Washington, D.C., like you get dressed up and you would, you would know you'd go to his office or his or her office, and then there would be someone to like check you into the building and then there'd be, there'd be someone to like get you into the waiting room and there'd be like there'd be a process right there'd be something going on there it would be kind of a, an established way to do things 
And that's got to be what they were expecting. You roll into a royal court, and there's got to be people to introduce and to say, you'll meet the king this afternoon at 2. Why don't, here's where you get a meal but between now and then. But these guys show up, and, and what is there? Well, when you walk into the home of a, a mom who's taking, a stay-at-home mom taking care of children, what do you find? You find someone doing dishes or washing diapers, right? This is just, this is, there's no like protocol here. There's no one to announce their presence. There's just Mary and there's Jesus over there playing with his toys that Joseph carved. Right? So I would not be surprised. It, it tells us that they knelt and they gave their gifts. It doesn't say that it happened immediately. I wonder... If they got to the house, they got the lay of the land, they said, let's go camp out for the night and we'll be back tomorrow. Like, I have nothing to base this on. I'm just kind of imagining how it would unfold. But like, I wonder if they went and got around a campfire and started asking themselves, what have we gotten ourselves into? This is not what we expected. Like, are we really gonna give these gifts? Like, the gifts that they have brought, they have brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, the king controls commerce, right? So gold makes sense. Frankincense, it is the, the tool of worship, right? And, and so the king is in charge of the worship of God. And myrrh, which is used to embalm. The king is in charge and it has powers of life and death. Like we rolled in expecting someone who looks like they're gonna have powers over economy, worship, and life and death. And we got Mary and Joseph, and Mary's up to our hand, up to our elbows in dishwater. Like, is this really what, what we're gonna do here? Is this really the situation? And, and let's acknowledge that they have a lot riding on this. If they're going to acknowledge a king can be born in such a situation, that may lead them to question things about their own status, right? Because think about what it means for, for their lives. In the first century, something like 95% of people were farmers because that's just what you had to do. The ability to produce a crop from the land was such that you could make a little bit more than you needed, just enough to plant for the next year, and everyone was a substance farmer. And so the fact that three, these uh, guys are royalty, they don't have to work for a living. Do you know how rare that would be? Like, the idea of retirement would not be invented for millennia. The idea of a weekend, yeah, that was still centuries off. Like, these guys get to live a life of study. They can read and write in a time when that's not a given, and they took years to learn how to do it. And not only did they have the time to learn how to read and write, they had the time to learn to read and write in language that's not their own, because they had to learn to read Hebrew to read the scriptures to learn about the star, right? So their status, their privilege, their that people keep on showing up and giving them food without them having to work is all based around their understanding of what it means to be royalty. And here they are confronted with a child who they believe to be royalty, but royalty in a very different way than they had ever seen. And so they are confronted with the problem of motivated reasoning. Let me explain what motivated reasoning is. I believe two things very passionately. Like, I would argue about both of these at great length. I passionately believe that the best Reuben you can find in northern Missouri is at Tall Paul's in Buckland, Missouri. It's amazing. They squish all the juice out of the sauerkraut. They use enough sauce. They chop up the meat. And they get it really mixed nicely. They put it on really good bread and they fry it each side. They put it in a skillet and put some butter in the skillet first. And I got to tell you, it is the best Reuben I have had in my life. It's amazing. I, second, I passionately believe that Methodism is the right place for me to follow Jesus. I believe that it is the place where the focus on grace and responsibility, the focus on methods, does it work, right? The connectional nature that we are in this together and I'm going to work with you and I'm going to work with the churches down the road. Like, I am passionately committed that Methodism is the right place for me to follow Jesus. 
Now, what would it take for you to cause me to change my mind on either of those? If you were to go over to Hannibal with me and we were to find a really good Reuben, you know what it'd take for me to, to, to agree that, to, to, to change my mind about a really good Reuben? It would take two Reubens. One to try it and say, that is good. And a second to make sure it wasn't a mistake. Make sure the restaurant can continue to hit it, right? For, so for the cost of two Reubens, you could change my mind about something I believe passionately. Because how much do I have wrapped up in that? Not much. I still believe if you're heading west, stop at Tall Paul's. Get a Reuben. Tell Kim Andy sent you. The second thing, I passionately believe that Methodism is the best place for me to follow Jesus. If you wanted to argue with me and argue me into changing my mind on that, what would it take? Andy, I think that you really should be Catholic. How much do I have wrapped up in this? My job, my retirement, my home, a decade and a half of a career, right? How much do I have wrapped up in it? A lot. That's what's called motivated reasoning, right? I have a lot of motivations to come to the same, re to reason my way through to an, arg to, to an end, right? If you're going to argue me out of being Methodist, it's going to take more than a good Reuben. And that's where these guys are, these magi. For them to give these gifts is not for them to question where is the best place to get a meal. It is for them to question the nature of what it means to be royalty, the, royal, the nature of royalty that has made it possible for them to live a life that they have enjoyed all of their lives. And so for them to go back... And to give these gifts and to kneel, to be able to, to say, you know, we've got a dog in this, but we think there's, we see Jesus and there's something going on here and we need to kneel and pay attention to it. That's pretty amazing, right? They knelt, they saw Jesus, like, they saw Jesus and they changed their minds and something, like, matters. And we've had moments like that in our lives. Like, this is called epiphany. This is the day of sudden realization. This is not the day of, I've been thinking about it for a while and I think it's time to retire, right? This is not the day of, you know, I've been chewing on it and I think that maybe we should move. This is the day of, whoa. I'm looking at somebody and I just saw something that messed with my head. Like the first time you see your child behind the wheel of a car. That mess with your head? How about the first time you see your dad in a hospital bed? I saw that recently. Messing with my head, right? Realizing something. The first time you see someone you know in a mug shot, right? First time you see your grandchild. First time you see someone you know in, in uniform, they grow up. You know, you, you know they grew up, but then they show up in a uniform, right? This is the day of epiphany. And epiphanies tend to happen when you look at somebody. And it messes with your head, and you go, ooh, something's happened in here, right? You see someone, and that's the risk when you look at someone, is something might happen. The Magi showed up, they put their eyes on Jesus, and that changed how they saw the world. It changed how they saw themselves, because they're royalty, but this child's royalty too. The risk for us, I believe, is that we might be like the other people in Bethlehem. Because think about all the other people in Bethlehem, right? There's a thousand people in Bethlehem, and three of them know about Jesus. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. What about the other 997? Did they know Joseph and Jesus and Mary? Yeah. Where do you get a good chair? Well, Joseph makes a good chair. Joseph, have any, have any kids? Yeah, he's got Jesus. He's short. Yeah. They, didn't, they knew of Jesus, but they did not see him. Not like the Magi did. I think that's the risk sometimes, is that we are surrounded by people who can show us if we but look. I had coffee with a dad this week, a dad who uh, has two teenage children, God help him, and the youngest teenage child is showing him something he'd never seen before. It is not my story to tell. 
But suffice it to say, it reminded me that just because you've seen someone before doesn't mean there's not something new to see. This, this dad is seeing his child and seeing something that he has not seen before. Right? And it's a good thing. But to look and to not be like the people in Bethlehem who can just walk past Jesus, but to be people who look and to see and to understand that there might be something there. I have a suspicion that for those magis, what they realized is that in looking at Jesus, that they were somehow seeing something more than just a king. A king and an infant, but there was something of the divine there. That you could, and that you could find something of God in something so common. Just a child born in a small village. They did not fully understand what was happening. Like, we don't know what happens to them. They go back to their homeland. What happens to them? We don't know. But what we do know is that they saw Jesus and that now they have to ask some questions. They knelt with certainty. And they, when they rose, they had new questions and they were a little bit more humble. I think that's a good thing to learn from the Magi. They rode, rode into town with certainty, they knelt before Jesus, and they rode out of town with a lot more questions than they started with. But they knelt before Jesus. It's not a bad thing to do. I think we're entering a year in which there's gonna be a lot of people making a lot of claims with a lot of certainty. I think to learn the lesson of the Magi is to say, let's look at people. Let's make sure to kneel before Jesus. And let's be a little bit humble about how we, have our, how we reason through things, knowing that we also can fall into motivated reasoning. We also have our own reasons not to change. But when we kneel before Jesus and we pay attention to him, well, sometimes we need to, to grapple with it. We think we know. Well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Let's kneel before Jesus together and see what happens. Amen.